It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. Welcome to everybody who is joining us online. We are so glad that you're with us this morning. So I'm standing in front of my fridge. I open the door. I'm scanning the shelves, looking for what I'm going to get. And I notice the temperature gauge on our fridge is just a little off. Like, I, I don't usually notice things like that when I open the fridge, but it's reading like 40 degrees. And I think to myself, I think it's supposed to be in the 30s. Like, I think it usually hovers around 37. I'd never noticed it before, but that morning I did. So I thought to myself, I'll just start paying attention to that. I'll see if it goes one way or the other. So the next morning I opened the fridge and I noticed now it's reading 41 degrees. The next day I noticed that it's reading 42 degrees and I'm starting to get nervous thinking that our fridge is about to die. So then like three days in, I open the fridge again, expecting to see 44 degrees, and it's dropped back down to 37 degrees, and I'm like, crisis averted, right? Now, two weeks go by, and it hovers right there at 37 degrees, but then I open it again on a Monday morning, and it's reading 40 again. I'm like, oh no. So it does that same cycle like two more times. And now I'm really thinking I should start looking, I should start pricing out fridges. And one day I go to get the fridge open and it's like this draft of warm air coming out of the fridge and the temperature gauge is reading 63 degrees. And so needless to say, we threw everything away, ordered a new fridge, the fridge comes, we bought it from Best Buy, and they, they deliver it, they, they put it in, they install it, it's great. The only thing that I have to do is I have to put in the shelves. It comes with four shelves. It comes with two large shelves and two small shelves. And so, I mean, the Best Buy guys did a great job. Cleaned up, they said, just put the shelves in and you're good to go. So the shelves are stored in the fridge, right? So I open up the fridge, you're supposed to put small shelf and large shelf in the freezer, and a small shelf and a large shelf in the fridge. So I install, and install is a really overinflated term <laughs> for what I did. I put them in. But I install the shelves in the freezer, and then I go to put the shelves in the fridge. I can get the bottom one in, the large one in, but the small one won't go. Like, it's just not going. So I'm like, like it's brand new, so I don't want to break it, but I'm pushing and I'm twisting and I'm trying to maneuver it. I go get a rubber mallet thinking I'll just tap, just tap. I didn't break anything, fortunately, because I knew enough, don't hit this thing too hard. So I can't get it in for the life of me. I have no idea why. So I call Best Buy and I say, hey, this, this fridge has the wrong shelves. Like I can't get the bottom small shelf in. So I'm going back and forth with Best Buy. And they say, okay. So what I thought was going to happen was they were going to say, we will send you a new shelf, right? It can't be that hard to send one shelf. And they say, sorry, sorry sir, um, we can't send you a new shelf because the shelves are packaged in the thing. What we can do for you is either give you a gift card or we have to bring you an entirely new fridge. I'm like, that seems to be overstated on how you should solve this problem, but thinking like, well, maybe because this is a large purchase, maybe the gift card will be a significant amount and I can get a new TV or a new <laughs> toy. So I say, how much for the gift card? And she says, $50. And I was like, Best Buy. Come on, you can do better than that. But at the end of the day, I really wanted the fridge to work the way it's supposed to work. It's a brand new fridge. So I say, you know, let's go with the new fridge. So they schedule delivery for a new fridge. A couple weeks goes by, they show up mid-morning, and one of the guys, there's like two guys. One of the guys comes in, and we're just talking through how we're gonna get this old fridge out, new fridge in, what we're gonna do. And so he says, okay, here's the plan, and I almost start unloading the fridge. When the other guy comes in, just to assess the situation, and the first guy didn't ask what was wrong. He was just going to swap out the fridge. The second guy comes and he's like, hey, it's the shelves, right? And I was like, yeah. And I'm showing him. Small shelf, large shelf in the freezer fits fine. Small shelf, large shelf in the fridge, small shelf doesn't fit. And he's looking at it. He's nodding. He's listening to me. He takes the large shelf from the freezer and puts it in the fridge. He takes the small shelf in my hand and puts it in the freezer. And he says, sir, 
that's how they're supposed to go. Too small on the top, too large on the bottom. Now, at one level, I felt like a complete moron. I mean, all I had to do was probably open the instruction manual and figure it out. It probably was listed on page one, and these two guys are looking at me, and I'm like, I have a master's degree, I'm a high-level leader, and therefore, I didn't say those things, but I'm thinking those things. And these guys are like, you are an idiot, sir, is what you are. Now, on one level, I felt wildly relieved as well, because I was like, I don't have to spend my whole morning cleaning this fridge out, reloading it, cleaning up from their mess. And I was just like, thank God for somebody who is smarter than me who works for Best Buy, right? Because if you've ever found yourself in a situation where things aren't working right, like what we oftentimes want and long for is a quick, easy fix, right? Someone who could come alongside us and just say, hey, 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 this is how that's supposed to go. And you're like, oh my gosh, you just saved me a week's worth of time, a month's worth of time, energy, high cost, wow. A quick, easy fix is oftentimes what we want when things aren't going the way we think they should. But oftentimes, that's not the way life works, right? Oftentimes, we find ourselves in situations where life isn't working the way we hoped, and things are challenging. Things are layered with complexity. Things are difficult and straining and confusing, and we find ourselves thinking, I have no idea what to do. Oftentimes, when we want things to be easy in a quick fix, it's not the case. And so it raises the question, like, what do we do? When we're faced with a situation where there is no easy fix, there isn't a quick resolution, and we're stuck in that difficulty and in that challenge, how do we respond. Our passage today speaks to that reality. Our passage today names how we are called to respond in moments when life isn't working the way that it should. And here's how our passage begins. This is Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 1. We read, one day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now, the way that this passage Acts 3 fits into the larger narrative flow of Acts is that Acts 2 ends with a description of this new Christian community that has formed. It says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to fellowship, to prayer. They devoted themselves to all these things. This new Christian community, it says, was always together all the time. They were caring for one another's needs. They were sharing meals daily together in each other's homes. And then it says, and they went to the temple daily to pray. So you have this general description at the end of Acts 2 of how this Christian community lived, and then you cross into chapter 3, and you have a specific example, a specific story of some of the things that were happening in the early church when they lived in that way. And this is what we see happening in chapter 3, verse 2. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. So Peter and John are heading to the temple along with the other disciples, and they see this lame man being carried and placed at a gate entering the temple courtyard. And sometimes I think we read passages of Scripture, especially ones that we're familiar with, and we miss the emotional weight of what's being described, right? Because basically, verse 2 sums up this guy's entire life. We're told that he's been lame since birth. You get to the end of chapter 4, you'll learn he's actually over 40 years old. Four decades plus of this guy's life, and he has had no easy solution. He has had no quick fix. 
He has lived his entire life watching everybody else in his community be self-sufficient while all the while he's needed help with everything, even from a little kid. He's watched his peers play games out in the neighborhood, play tag and kick the can and hide and seek. And the best that he could do is just watch and maybe cheer them on. Through his teen years, he watched his peers learn the family trade, become a carpenter and build homes or furniture for people, become a fisherman and be out on the lake all day scooping fish from the lake to feed the family, to be a, a, a masonry and make bricks or to be a leather worker and make clothes for people. He, he's watched his peers become contributing members of society. And then into his adult years, he's watched people get married, have families, and live wildly fulfilled lives. And the best that he can do now is just sit at a gate, which, by the way, he is placed at the gate. He is carried by somebody else and placed there. You got to wonder, like, what goes through his mind? The shame that he feels. Like, do I have any worth? Like, do I have any value? The best I can hope for is rattle a cup and get some loose change. Hey, you got to wonder at what level this desire and longing for a certain life has eroded to way to resignation to like this, this is just as good as it gets for me. There are no quick fixes. There are no easy solutions. Now, not only does verse 2 sum up this guy's life, but I think for many people here this morning, verse 2 might sum up our own lives as well. Because what we see from this man is that his life is broken. Like it's not working the way God intended it to be. He, he's in massive need. He's struggling from one day to the next. The best he can hope for is for somebody to carry him and place him outside the temple courts so that he can beg. He's broken in need and begging. I think many people's lives, maybe even here this morning, would be characterized in the same way. They're broken. You will find yourself in a massive place of need. And at some level, you are begging for things to be different. Maybe not publicly. Maybe you're not on a street corner begging people to help you. But internally, there's this narrative going on in your head. There's this voice going on in your head. And maybe even in your prayer life, you're praying to God, begging God, make things different for me. I would long for things to be different. One of the realities of being a pastor is sometimes you get invited in to those begging moments and conversations in people's lives. They sit in your office or they sit with you at a coffee shop over a cup of coffee and say, oh, I'm just begging for my spouse to be different. I'm just begging for him or her to change their life because it's destroying the way that our whole family is living. Or, or maybe, maybe you find yourself begging to find a spouse. You've wanted to be married your entire life, and you see other people, and you're like, why isn't that true of me? Or maybe you did find a spouse, but now you can't have kids, and you're finding yourself begging. Like, why is it everybody else's joy apart from mine? What is the situation in your life that you are begging God to change? For this guy, over four decades of begging, probably at some level begging God to make things different for him, and at another level begging for change, maybe because his family said, that's the best you can do for us. So he finds himself sitting there begging. So Peter and John are headed to the temple, and no doubt they've seen this guy before, right? Because the text tells us he is placed there every day. The text also tells us that Peter, John, along with the other disciples are going to the temple every day. So certainly their paths have had to cross before, but on this day, things are going to end up very different for this man. Verse 3, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Maybe he, he gets close enough where he can pull on Peter's cloak 
or he's got a cup and he can rattle it loud enough to get Peter's attention. And we read in verse 4 that Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. And just notice the intensity of this moment, right? Peter looked straight at him, maybe even like looking through him into his soul, right? And then he commands this guy's attention by saying, look at us, exclamation mark, right? It's not just, hey, look at us. It's look at us. And we read that this man gave them his attention. I imagine there's like intense eye contact. There's like this pregnant pause in the conversation. He's like, okay, like what? What's coming next? And maybe even people around him hear Peter's response, look at us, and they say, okay, we will look too. What's going on over here? And this moment creates expectation for the man who's begging. Second part of verse 5, so the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. Now, the text doesn't say he was expecting to get money, but that's a natural conclusion. He's begging for money. He's expecting to get something, probably money. Now, have you ever been in a situation where you're expecting to get something and what you get isn't at all what you thought it would be? Right? Oftentimes, that leaves you frustrated. It leaves you disappointed and maybe even angry. Uh, over the weekend, we did some trick-or-treating with our kids. And when you're young and you go trick-or-treating, like the prize possession that you are on the hunt for when you are trick-or-treating is the full-size candy bar, right? <laughs> the full-size candy bar. Um, so we were trick-or-treating, and somewhere along the way, one of our kids hears a friend, uh, another kid say to his friend, hey, I got a full-size candy bar. And they're like, where's that happening? <laughs> So they were, we were able to figure out it was on this street. And so they're like on the hunt. And we found the house that was giving out the full-size candy bar. Now, the way that they did it, I thought was brilliant. These guys had a table at the end of their driveway. And they had this regular bowl of candy, like just small size pieces. And they're like, you can take four pieces from the bowl, or you can take what's in the mystery box. And you don't know what's in the mystery box, right? And the mystery box is where they put the full-size candy bars. So... The girls are like, oh, yeah, yeah, take the mystery box. So one of our daughter's friends goes first. She doesn't get a full-size candy bar, but she gets this massive sleeve of Oreos. And she's like, score, I got a whole sleeve of Oreos. And then it was my daughter's turn, and she's weighing her options. What's in the mystery box? Because they were very clear that if you choose the mystery box, you had to take what was in the mystery box. You couldn't trade it for candy from the bowl. So my first daughter goes, okay, I'll take the mystery box. He opens it up. And it's a can of tomato juice. And she's like, you've got to be kidding me. Next daughter goes, next daughter goes, her friend also gets a full-size candy bar. And she goes, I'll take the mystery box. She got a bottle of clam juice. It was the best moment of my night. I was like, this is life, ladies. This is life, right? When you're expecting something and you don't get it, there's this journey from hope and expectation to disappointment, oftentimes, and despair. But for this guy, what he was expecting was money. But he was about to get something way better than he could ever anticipate. Verse 6, then Peter said to him, silver and gold I do not have at which his heart must have sank. Like, that's what I'm asking for. That's what I'm longing for. You're telling me to look at you. I'm giving you my attention. I'm expecting to get something for you from you. It's obviously supposed to be money, so why are you telling me you don't have any? And he goes, but what I do have, implication being, which is better, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Walk. If I'm this guy, I am wildly confused at this moment. Walk. Like, don't, don't you know who I am? Like, don't you know the reputation that I have? 
You've seen me here every day. Not once have I walked on my own two feet to get here. Not once have I walked on my own two feet to live here, leave here. And you're telling me to walk? Verse 7, taking him by the right hand. This guy was probably in utter disbelief. So much so that Peter had to take him by the hand to show him and prove to him what has happened. He helped him up and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Like earlier we said, sometimes when we read passages that we're familiar with, we lose sight and we miss the emotional weight of the moments. In the same way that sometimes we miss, miss the weight of the emotional lows, we also can miss the weight of the emotional highs. This guy has never used his legs before. Right? Never once used his legs. His legs are probably atrophied. His muscles are shriveled. You can probably pinch your pointer finger and your thumb around the middle of his leg because there's nothing there. His legs might be awkwardly bent. Never used them once. And, once, and we're told in verse 8, he jumps to his feet. He doesn't just stand up shakingly. He jumps to his feet and walks for the first time. You bet the joy and the elation of this moment was through the roof. It reminds me of when parents see their kids walk for the first time and the joy that they experience like this. Take a look. Come on. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Come on. Come on, you can come. <laughs> ah, isn't that amazing? Like those are the moments we live for. Those are the moments to see new life come into this world. New things take place and that very same thing is happening for this guy. It's a moment that results in joy and praise, and wonder. We're told this in verse 8. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And it's not just him who's in awe and wonder. It says in verse 9, when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. An amazing moment. At Meadowbrook Church, we say that our mission statement is this. This is the point of this series, is to look through our mission statement. That, that Meadowbrook Church exists to invite people to discover Jesus, to become his followers who can ultimately influence the world, right? And we say regularly there are four words that carry the weight of this statement. Invite, discover, become, influence. This moment is a massive moment of discovery for this guy discovering who Jesus is and what he can do. And it's not just a moment of discovery for him, but for everybody else in the temple. Because Peter, being the opportunistic preacher that he is, sees a crowd is forming and doesn't waste this moment to teach others about who God is in light of what has just happened. Verse 11, while the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. Crowds are gathering. Peter wastes no moment, pipes up and begins to preach. Verse 12. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our power or godliness we had made this man walk? Now from this moment in chapter 3 to the rest of the chapter, to the end of the chapter, what you have is a sermon from Peter. There's a lot happening, and we're not going to dive into it in depth, but I want to highlight three things. Three things that Peter names that he is trying to declare about who God is, that this man and the group of people seeing this miracle having taken place discover about who God is. And the first thing that Peter declares is that God's power is transformative in our lives, right? His opening question in his sermon is, why do you stare at us as if it's by our power that made this man walk? See, so much of our lives is spent trying to acquire more power. You, you may not think of your life in those terms, 
But naturally, instinctively, we're always trying to acquire more power. Maybe it's within a certain position, a certain position in a company or a community that somehow is going to give you influence. Because as you look at this company or you look at the community, you're like, this thing is a train wreck. And if I just had the power, I could fix it and make it better. Maybe it's some position of influence so that you could have some measure of recognition because you really like control and you think to yourself, if I was in that spot, I could control people to do the things that I wanted to do. Or, or maybe it's the pursuit of more money because you know that money is power and you just think, hey, if I have money, I can command people to do things because they're going to be impressed by the amount of money that I have. And this happens in all sorts of contexts, not just your job. It could also be in the schools. You look at what's happening in the schools, you're like, I'm going to get into power so I can fix the thing, right? It also happens in churches. People want to be in power in churches so they can somehow control what's going on. So much of our life, whether we realize it or not, is an attempt to try and get more power. In the pursuit of power, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, is self-seeking to get us to a place where we can get whatever it is we want, even if our perception is it will also help other people. It's usually self-serving. But the unique thing about God is that he's not self-centered, he's other-centered. And the reality is he has all the power. The power that we're after is nothing more than an illusion because compared to the power that God has, ours is nothing. He has it all. He sustains things by his powerful word. He holds all things together. He has all the power. And at times gives us some, but he's the one who has it all. And what his power does, because it's other-centered, is transforms those he loves who open themselves to him. Did you notice what it said in verse 10? What people noticed about this guy? They said, that's the guy who used to sit and beg. He was the guy who used to live that way. His life looked different. Even just a few minutes ago, he used to live in that way, but God's power changed and transformed him, and now he is completely different. And the way that we open ourselves up to God's power is through laying down the pursuit of our own, to let go of trying to gain and acquire and achieve more, and then we're postured in a way to receive his. Not only does Peter declare that God's power is transformative, Peter also declares that God's promise is restorative. Because he says this in verse 21, heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything. The main thrust of Peter's sermon is basically that God is fulfilling his promised plan in and through the person of Jesus. That namely, Jesus died on the cross to absorb the punishment of sin for the entire world. Did you know that there is sin in your life? Has anybody told you that recently? We don't like to hear that. Somebody's raising their hand like, yep, somebody told me recently. <laughs> yeah. Was it your husband? Did he tell you recently? Yeah. Like sometimes we forget that. We think we are perfect. The gospel, which is the good news, continually reminds us that we're not, that we are in need, that we are in need of rescue, that we are in need of a savior. Jesus is fulfilling his plan, not only for Israel, but through the, and for the entire world through Jesus, both in his death, but also in his resurrection. He was raised by the power of God, and now he has ascended. He has returned back to the Father, which means we are in the process and in a posture of waiting until he returns. That's why it says in verse 21, heaven must receive him. He is in heaven with the Father until the time comes for God to restore everything as he has promised long ago through his holy prophets. So that means the world we live in while we are waiting is broken. And it needs to be restored. Again, just this week, 
there was a mass shooting in the state of Maine that killed 18 people. I almost missed it in the news. Why? Because there's so much other horrific stuff happening. It's getting buried, and we're so used to mass shootings. It's like, yep, there's another one. Unless it's at a school or it targets children, it's like second, third page, fourth page news, right? But our world is massively broken. And in those moments, there are no quick fixes. When a community is turned upside down because of violence like that, there is no easy solution. And we find ourselves in a place of aching and groaning, saying, when? Like, when is it going to change? So what do you do? Takes us back to our opening question. What do you do when there is no quick fix? What do you do when there is no easy solution? What Peter says in his sermon is we are called to live in a posture of faith. Verse 16. By faith, right? This is in addition or in, in response to his question. Do you think it was us, our power, who made this man walk? Verse 16, by faith, in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him as you can all see. On one level, this is an encouraging verse. It is by faith in Jesus' name. But there's also tension with this verse because sometimes this verse gets misperceived to think, well, the way that I fix my life is I just believe. I just believe more. I believe harder. I believe longer. I exercise my faith. And so if things are broken and not being fixed, and I think faith is the solution, it could easily be that we perceive there's something wrong with my faith. If my life isn't working out the way that I want, and I am believing, maybe I'm not believing enough. Which really is you placing your faith in your faith. And it means you're using faith as an attempt to control and manipulate God to try and get what you want. And what we're told in Hebrews 11, what we're told is that faith is assurance of what we hope for. Faith is confidence in the thing we cannot see. It's confidence for what is going to come. That verse 21, one day, everything will be restored. Um, earlier this month, many of you know that Becky's dad passed away. And um, we've received tons of cards from people, which has been very encouraging. One of the ones we got was a painting that somebody painted and gave us. We have a picture of it. And I don't know if you can read the line on it. It says, everything sad will come untrue. One of the best lines I've heard in the longest time. That everything sad will come untrue. Talk about powerful. Like as we look into the future, I don't see that today. But I have hope that it's coming. And sometimes in the here and now, we get, we get glimpses of when that will happen, like a man who is lame, who is healed. But oftentimes we don't. We don't get those glimpses. And so basically you could say this. What Peter is trying to say is that faith is assurance of our future. Faith is assurance of what is to come, that in this broken mess we live in now, one day, Everything that's sad will come untrue. And notice where we're called to place our faith, right? Verse 16, we place our faith in Jesus' name. What Peter is declaring, what this crowd is discovering, is that not only is God's power transformative, not only is his promise restorative, but Jesus' name, God's name, is authoritative. There's authority. Authority because of who he is, because he is the true king of the entire world, because he sits on the throne in heaven, because he holds all things together, and it's proven that he's the king by his resurrection, that God has raised him from the dead. He is the first seeds, the signpost, the deposit of what's coming for the rest of us who believe. Everything sad will come untrue because Jesus Christ has raised from the dead. And so what we do in the here and now is we call 
on the name of Jesus, not as some magical incantation, if I say it so many times, it will make my life better, but we do it as a way to say his power and his authority is actually mine. It says in Luke 9 that when Jesus sent out the disciples, he sent them out with his power. He sent them out with his authority. He's offering it up to us for us to know that because of him, because of who he is and what he has done in my life, I have the power and the authority to name that the strongholds of this life don't win over me. We were singing earlier, no weapon formed against me will prosper. What does it mean to live by faith? It means to remind yourself of that daily, to have courage to face the day. And I can walk through this day. I can beat this day. And I can beat everything that comes at me through this day because of who Jesus is in my life. I can take his power. I can take his authority. I can push it down deep in my belly and know that nothing in this world can beat me. No weapon formed against me will prosper. Even if I'm begging for my circumstances to change. Even if I'm in need and I need to be carried around because I don't have the strength to do it on my own. I'm victorious because Jesus has rose from the grave. Amen? Amen. And so faith is assurance of our future that one day everything that is sad will come untrue. And so we wait for that day. We have hope for that day. And we trust that in the meantime, God's power in my life can change things. God's promise is firm and secure, and he will restore things. And it's through the name of Jesus that I'm a victor, even when it feels like sin, darkness, and death are winning. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for the assurance that we have through your resurrection. We thank you so much for all that you have done for us. That even when we are faithless, you are faithful. That you provide us everything that we need, as we read earlier today. That you provide for the birds of the air. You provide clothes for the flowers of the field. You have given us all we need and more. And it's through faith that we access that. And so I ask this morning that you would help us receive that reality and look to you, knowing that no weapon formed against me will prosper, but what you have done for us will. I pray this in your name. Amen.